Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So the uh, uh, topic of my uh, today's talk is the BitTube, uh, which is a basically a web-based peer-assisted uh, uh, VOD uh, solution. I can move it up uh, further. Uh, so I'll, I'll, my my student coined this name BitTube, uh, which I like very much because it's it's pretty much carry the idea through which is you, you want to combine these two uh, great technologies uh, using uh, BitTorrent solutions to uh, save uh, bandwidth cost for the video services, uh, very popular internet video services uh, represented by the YouTube uh, today. OK, a little self-introduction. Uh, I got my PhD from Illinois in 2005, and uh, in the uh, summer of 2004, I spent uh, I spent the summer of 2004 uh, at this uh, institution. Uh, back then, I was doing the peer-to-peer -peer streaming research with Jin Lee. Uh, you know, four years later, I'm still doing peer-to-peer -peer streaming research. Uh, uh, since I graduated, I uh, I joined the uh, Vanderbilt University. In case you wonder where that is. At the, at the university is located at Nashville, which is the capital of the state of Tennessee, which is the, right in the middle of the country. It is known for as, uh, as a music city. Uh, my research has been, uh, you know, this, this research won't be, uh, uh, won't be possible without the generous support of the following sponsors. Uh, the National Science Foundation, and the gift money from Microsoft Research, and finally uh, the discovery grant offered by our university, which is essentially a seed grant. So we, we acknowledge the generous support of all these organizations, uh, which allow us to do such a research. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will start by motivating, you know, uh, why we do what we do. And uh, after that, I'm going to talk about a few design issues, you know, a few questions we've been thinking about when we design this uh, system. And that, uh, after that, I'm going to talk about implementation issues. So basically, uh, uh, sort of the questions that we are trying to answer, you know, how to build the BitTube uh, in a more efficient way. So it turns out we did some tweaks over the BitTorrent system, the current BitTorrent system, on this, uh, on this topic. And uh, finally, I'm going to spend some time uh, uh, presenting our results. So we mostly run, we can't get the users, uh, as I have uh, uh, explained to you guys. So what we do is that we just deploy the system over the Planet Lab test bed. Uh, that's the best we can do, and we pull out lots of results from there. And I'm going to share that with you. <coughs> so let me start with the motivation. Um, so uh, undoubtedly, internet video is very popular today. And uh, there are lots of uh, investment poured into this uh, in, 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 into this venue, uh, hoping that uh, they will grab some uh, advertisement at, at uh, revenue from it. Uh, so actually, I borrowed the statistics uh, from Gene's slides uh, when he visited us uh, in the last uh, in the last fall. So, despite the uh, uh, the hypes, you know, in all these uh, uh, in, in in this uh, arena. So uh, a, a working reality is that all these services will cost will cost you a fortune. Okay, uh, the operating cost is very high. And if you think about the cost of you know the host service and the, the the storage space you have to purchase the infrastructure support and also the management support. But again, the single most uh, 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 the, the single greatest of cost will still remains to be the bandwidth subscription. So, YouTube being the lead players in the market, uh, <coughs> being a private company held by Google, nobody knows exactly how much money they spend on the bandwidth cost. Actually, they have there has been guesses uh, way uh, along the years, way before they got purchased by the Google. I, I remember the first article I, I found out about the you know guessing the bandwidth cost of YouTube is the, is in the early 2006 before they were bought out by Google. So back then, the, the, the estimate is around $1 million per, uh, per month. Now, 
And so the people keep guessing, you know, when the when the company got when the, when the, when their service got more popular. And right now, the the, the latest uh, uh, sort of article I saw estimates the cost to be a million dollars per day. So anyway, so it's. So one thing we know for sure is it's got to be millions of dollars per month, you know, for the for the bandwidth cost for YouTube as the uh, leading video service company. So can we save cost? Can we save this cost? So well, so the uh, when you think about this uh, problem, so obvious the uh, uh, remedy you you think of is is the peer to peer solutions, and of of course peer to peer has been there for many years and it has a very successful track of records. Uh, when you serve this kind of application, the broadcasting and live streaming, uh, uh, live streaming applications. In fact, there are many companies, uh, startup companies, doing that. Um, <coughs> they have been showing to be very successful. So the basic semantic of this kind of application is that uh, uh, you have a uh, you have a service which hosts uh, usually in the order of hundreds of TV channels. Okay. And uh, as a client, you download a program which basically, which usually includes the networking components and the media playback components. So, so it basically looks like, has the look of a media player. And uh, you can choose the channel you want to join in. Uh, when you join the channel, you are seeing whatever the current content that is being displayed, that is being broadcasted over that channel. So it's pretty much the same way, uh, the, the, pretty much the same way that you're watching a TV. Uh, <coughs> for this kind of application, uh, so you don't quite worry. Uh, so uh, the nice thing about this kind of application is the continuous scalability. So if your channel only has one audience, fine. You know you stream the content from the server. If you have a, if you have two if you have two users two users watching this uh, channel at the same time, sure you can stream a, you can uh, you can stream the content from the server to peer one, and also probably uh, relay the the stream from peer one to peer two. So if you assume that each peer is able to support at least one one other peer. In, uh, in other words, if you assume that the outbound bandwidth of a peer ha is enough to support another guy, so you can have a very nice property over this kind of system, which is over each channel, you only need the server only needs to have enough bandwidth to sub support one peer, and the rest of the problem with support uh, is, 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 is solved by the peers themselves. So it's very nice. So uh, this kind of services got very successful technically. Um, so now the challenge is: can you use, uh, can you apply peer-to-peer -peer technology over the on-demand applications? If you re if you think about how YouTube works, basically, so if you're a user, uh, you can go to their website and uh, basically check out whatever videos you want to see, it, and you can choose to watch these videos at any time you want. So. <clears throat> The semantics are quite different from the case of live streaming. So what we are looking for is a phenomenon I call the peer aggregation. Uh, I define it as the number of peers are accessing the same media file at the same time, okay, simultaneously. How do you, you know, what kind of factors do you need to basically uh, promote such a phenomenon? Which, uh, you need three. The first one is that you need high access rate over a particular popular video file. So, the popularity of the video file has to be has to be quite different. You know, there has to be some very hot clips, there has to be some very unpopular clips that nobody sees. So you you have to have that. Second is, not only you want to have a very popular video files, but the all the all they also they, there also has to be some very uh, pop uh, period of time where this pop this movie this videos got very popular. So it. For instance, when your videos go on to the top page of the of YouTube website, or it's got very popular around around people, uh, you know, uh, when it first got out, like this, like the new release of certain hot movies, so the popularity of the uh, the popularity of this file has to be sort of a, uh, uh, has to be sort of irregular along the time. So there has to be some time it's very popular, it has to be some time it doesn't it's not very popular, and. When you have both of these, you still need the third factor, which is that uh, you want the peers to stay online a little bit more. You know, so if you are done watching this video clip, instead of leaving, you want to still stay online for a while so that the peer, other peers can catch up on you. So if you have all these three factors uh, ready for you, you can, you, can have, you can have a peer aggregation. So is that possible? Um, this is a piece of work we have done. I have done uh, a few years back. 
So what I did is a theoretical study uh, over the on-demand that scenario. So an important result we obtained back then is that you need the third factor, the online duration is very important. So if your peer choose to stay online after you are done watching the video, just for a little while, you know, uh, so the buffering time, this is what I meant by the buffering time here. So if the buffering time is only a very small portion of the playback time of the movie, that should be enough. That should, be, that should help you to be able to sort of prolong uh, the period of time that you stay online where another peer, a later peer, can join you. So that when the, when the later peer can join you, you can actually relay your content to another peer so that sort of the chain, the relay chain goes on. So, so what we show here is that when the request rate is relatively low, okay, the server, the required server bandwidth still go up, but they will reach some kind of a, a, a tip point where if you go, if the request rate still uh, continues to go on, continues to increase, uh, continues to increase, the server will actually drop because uh, the request rate got dense enough and also because the peers stay for a relatively small period of time, they can form a relay chain and when they form a relay chain, they relieve the server from being able to serve other peers. So that's our results. And also, uh, this is the result achieved by the Microsoft researchers here. So what they do is that they take the traces of the uh, on-demand service run by the MSN video. Uh, they study that for, in, uh, for an extended period of time over many streaming requests and uh, many uh, unique video files. And so what they uh, find out about is that uh, if you apply some very simple peer-to-peer -peer streaming solutions over these choices, they found a remarkable uh, server bandwidth reduction. Uh, actually, if you do the mass, simple math here, the, 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 the server load reduction is actually 96.5% or something like that. It's, it's, it's tremendous. So, uh, so we read this paper in the last year when we were in the process of developing this system, the VTube, so we were very excited to see these results. Um, so, what, we are trying, what I'm trying to say is, is that it has been sort of confirmed theoretically and also through the tree study that peer-to-peer -peer is able to, should be able to, you know, uh, support the on-demand video streaming applications given the nature of the user request. So, a natural next step is that, uh, how about building such a system? And also, a good, a good a, a important conclusion we reach from the previous two studies and also other, stu uh, other work is that although peer-to-peer -peer can greatly help reducing the server load, but you cannot replace the server. You always have to put the server there, okay? The reason is this. First, there are hot videos. There are also unpopular videos, okay? If the videos are, videos are unpopular, they are, they are likely to be only possessed by the server. If the server is the only guy to have this video file, you probably still need the server to be there and a server request in case there is one. And also, the population of the peer fluctuates. As I say, that the, uh, the, even for a hot videos, the request rate over this video still varies greatly along the time. So, for instance, think about the beginning phase when a new video was just got released. So the only one who has a copy of this video is the server. No peers have these videos yet. So at this time, from the time when the videos got released until the time that enough peers already possess the copies of these videos, at that particular period of time, you still need the server support. So basically, from another viewpoint, you can think about the server as a super peer, okay, uh, running an HTTP protocol or a seed uh, in the language of BitTorrent. So, so that motivated us and uh, to basically go ahead and develop such a system to see how it actually performs in the real world. So what I'm going to do next is to, uh, present some of the design issues here. So, okay, so we're gonna I'm going to talk about architecture and some of the user requests and data flow. So when we go ahead and design this thing, so the first, so the, the, the biggest concern we have is that, you know, the it, as a video, the internet video is already a very large industry. So if we ever want to make this solution adoptable, you know, possibly adoptable, 
we want to bring the minimum, so we want to minimize the inter in interruptions that we introduce uh, to the existing infrastructure. So that's the top things we have in our mind when we design this thing. So for instance, if you think about all the YouTube and other websites, they have already has a very mature structure uh, of their websites. They have billions of videos archived. You don't want to disrupt that. And, you, know, you can't say, oh, I have a great technology. It can save you 90% of bandwidth money. But you have to build your website from scratch. You have to tear down whatever you have right now and build everything from scratch. They're going to say, forget about it. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that when we choose the peer-to-peer -peer technology, you know, there are lots of existing solutions there, and which one do we, do we choose? And we think that we, we should choose the one that is the most commonly accepted uh, te techniques. With, so this is the easy choice. We, we choose BitTorrent for some reason that we'll explain a few slides later. And the last thing is that the, the reason why the internet video got so popular today is that it, it is so usable. You, know, you just uh, browse on the website, you click on the thumbnail, it starts to play. So you don't want to disrupt that. So you, you want to retain the usability uh, where you just need one mouse click to basically watch the video. So this is our architecture. So this is pretty much what happened today in the client-server world. So basically on the user side, uh, you have two components. You have a web browser, which, whose job is to send out requests to the server. And in return, the server re uh, feedback the video data uh, which, which, which is consumed by your Flash player. Where, uh, when receives the uh, beginning portion of the video file, the Flash player starts to play. So that's what will happen in the current client-server world. It's pretty neat, uh, only, only when the server costs a lot of money to, to uh, buy their bandwidth. So what we do is that, so we want to keep that. You know, we, this is, we sort of, at least from the user perception, you know, we want to keep that. So what we do is that uh, we, <coughs> introduce the underlying components both on the client side and the server side. So on the client side, we basically, what we do is basically we, we, install, we install the desktop's uh, component on each of the client machine. Uh, basically, it compo con consists of two components. One component is the interception component. Its job is to intercept the request shot out by the web browser and start to do some processing here. I will have some more explanation of how things go in this part of the uh, flow, request flow. And it also, it, it, after it downloads the file, it shoots the video, back, video player back to, so video data back to the flash player. So it basically gets, gives a conception, sort of gives the feeling to the user that you are still, you're still streaming your video file from some kind of, from a server somewhere, but without realizing that actually that server is at, on the local side. Now, on the server side, what we do is that we introduce a tracker, okay, because if you want to use a BitTorrent, you need a tracker to basically help maintain the peer list, the list of peers who are possessing uh, whatever files, video files that you're watching. So this is the overall architecture, and uh, I can talk about more about how the request flow goes. So here we go. Let's say at the beginning, <coughs> the user shoots out the request. Uh, asking to watch some kind of video file. And what we do here is that we, we want this request to be, able to, to be able to be intercepted by the local component. The, the, this is the component uh, uh, working on the client, uh, client side. Um, how, we, how do you do that? Well, you have to change the string of the URL a little bit. So basically, you want to make the IP address to be actually the local host, you know, 127.0.0.1. This is how you actually get, basically you're shooting the request to the local host. Okay, this is how you make the local host to be able to get this request. Instead, you hide the real URL of the video into, uh, as a sort of a parameter in the, uh, of this URL stream. And also, the other thing you want to provide there is the URL of the torrent file, which basically is the meta file uh, of, the, of the video file. So that's the first thing happening here. Okay. Then the request got uh, intercepted here, and it got basically the, uh, this process, parse this stream, and should the, and further relay the URLs uh, to these two components here. It gives the torrent URL to the thread, to the peer-to-peer -peer thread. It gives the video URL to the client-server thread. And these two threads start to work simultaneously to try to grab, to gra try to grab data from their own component, from, from, uh, from their own uh, servers. So the peer-to-peer -peer threads try to grab the data 
from other peers. And, and, and in, order, in, order, in order to do that, it will first try to get a peer list from the BitTorrent tracker. And the client server thread will try to still try to get the data from the server. So basically, it's a hybrid approach. You, know, you want to get grab data both from the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, world and also from the client server world. And the reason is that, as I, as, as I explained a few, a few slides back, uh, because there are occasions that either the, bit, either the video file doesn't exist in the peer-to-peer -peer world yet, or the peer-to-peer -peer world does not have enough bandwidth to support, uh, to, support the stream, to support the video streaming. And luckily, because the current uh, video server uses the HTTP protocol, so we discover a very useful feature here is called the range field. Okay. So starting the uh, 1.1 uh, version of HTTP, they allow you to basically only uh, download a portion of the video file. All you have to do is basically specify the byte offset, the starting byte offset and the ending, uh, ending byte offset of the particular piece of data you want to download from the file. And the server is going to return to you by that. So, in a sense, you do not change the existing infrastructure video server. They are still using the whatever HTTP server you're, they are using, like Apache or Light uh, or Lighty, whatever HTTP server they are using, as long as the server supports uh, this protocol, you're fine. The infrastructure should be working. Question so far? It seems uh, I th on top of UDP or TCP? A uh, PDP thread uses BitTorrent. <laughs> BitTorrent uses TCP, right? Hmm? Uh, they all can actually use Both TCP. like control message and the packet data. They all use TCP, right? Okay. We didn't change that. We only did a few tweaks to BitTorrent. BitTorrent is a very stable software. We do, and you know. The, the BitTorrent has a kit for time strategy. Do you inherit the Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. So we did a few tweaks to the BitTorrent to basically accommodate, to basically serve the streaming application better. So, um, OK. So I talked about the change to server side. So basically, you need a tracker running here. Um, so if you more for, further think about that, so, so the first, you know, first thought that came to, your, to, to, came to our mind is that you know, who's going to run this thing? Well, you know, video server, the video service could, abs could uh, obviously run this track server, tracker. You know, the YouTube can run this tracker. And let me think, think more on that. It doesn't have to be in this case. So actually, the tracker could be maintained by a separate business. You know, and if you think about that, actually, this peer-to-peer uh, -peer service can, could actually sort of uh, be affiliated with multiple video services, right? There's, uh, there, there doesn't have to be the the one-to-one the, the -one mapping in terms of the video server and the tracker doesn't have to be the case. You know, you can have as a video as a peer-to-peer -peer service, you can actually serve multiple video services. On the other hand, as a video service, you can actually subscribe to multiple peer-to-peer -peer services too. You know, because uh, all you have to do is that, suppose you have mi millions of files on, in your archive, you can actually you know, choose, you know, oh, I want, to, I want to sort of register this portion of my files to this peer-to-peer -peer service. I want to register this, another portion of the files into another peer-to-peer -peer service. All you have to do is to generate different torrent files so that the torrent files point to the different uh, tracker services. So the, they can go either way. You know, uh, as the video services, you can choose multi, sort of a, like multi-homing approach. You can, you can register yourself to multiple video uh, tracker services. As a tracker service, you can, you can serve multiple clients. And the bottom line is that what kind of changes, you know, if you're running a video services now, what kind of changes do you have to do? Two things. First one is that you have to modify the way you define the URL of your videos. Uh, from this, the video URL, to something like this. So you have to do a simple HTTP string change. The other thing you want to change is that you want to introduce a new component where each time a new video got uploaded, you generate a torrent file of that video and also you know, put that torrent file somewhere, make that torrent file point to some kind of tracker. These are the two changes you make, uh, only two changes you have to make. Other, for other functionalities and structures of your, of, your, of your web services, you don't have to change, you have to change that at all. So we just build a prototype to, uh, uh, to prove our idea. And uh, in terms of website, it has the same look as any other video website. And uh, the difference is here. So we build this component. We make this sort of, we hide it in the, in the, in the, uh, in the tree area of the, of the operating system. So 
so basically, this one is stays in the memory all the time. So it will it, it is serves as a peer-to-peer -peer component. It intercepts the request, uh, HTTP request by the uh, by the website uh, from from the user, and then also it does its own things and return the video file back to uh, uh, back to the flash back to the flash player here. And also, uh, it is able to ready to serve other peers. Okay. So that's what it does. So basically, it's a BitTorrent. It's a hidden BitTorrent client with an addition of a, a interception process, whose job is to intercept HTTP requests. So uh, one more thing I want to add is that uh, we've been discussing. You know, okay. Bottom line is that you need some kind of a desktop soft software running in your local machine. That's how the peer-to-peer -peer works. And the question is, how would you package, you know, this software? Besides. Uh, our option here, the option we finally choose is that we want to run this software as an independent process, okay, uh, hidden in the tree area. There are also other, other projects too. You can package this software as the applet, as the Java applet. Uh, also, one extreme uh, uh, suggestion I got is that how about build the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, service, the BitTorrent functionality in a Flash player. Uh, it will be a it will be a nightmare if not if at all uh, possible to sort of implement the BitTorrent functionality in the action script. But anyway, so the reason why we choose that choose this option is that uh, this option will allow the software to to be running as long as it could. So basically, if in this option this soft, the software will run as long as the machine is up. Okay. If you choose the applet approach, the software the lifespan of the software is within the lifespan of the browser. If you close the browser, the peer-to-peer -peer functionality is closed. Okay. And again, if you build that thing into the Flash player, when the Flash player is gone, you know, when, when you switch to another page, your service stops. And as, I have, uh, as we have uh, um, discussed in the uh, <coughs> beginning of this talk, online, make peers stay online is very important. Okay. Uh, it, it allows us allows allows it to basically basically it prolongs the servicing time of the peers, allowing it to help uh, more help uh, more other peers. You know, so the making the peers stay online as as, as much as they could is very important to the uh, to the to the system efficiency to the uh, in terms of the server load reduction, which is the single most performance uh, single most uh, important performance results in our system. On the other hand. You don't want the user, sorry, you don't want the user to have the feeling that you are sticking up their computer and stealing their bandwidth. So what we choose to do is to sort of make that visible, make this thing visible in, in the system, but uh, still without uh, sort of interrupting the users, disrupting the users. So that's why we choose to uh, leave such a desktop uh, icon on the tree area. So reminding the user that, okay, there are something, there's a P2P component running. So if you don't like it, close it. So these are our concerns when we design the system. Does user need to download the software? Yes, they have to. Question is, does user have to download the software? Yes, they have to have to install it. I hate that. And, uh, but uh, again, we want to make them stay as long as possible. That's the price we have to pay. Can this one be uh, like a plugin in our user web browser? If it's a plugin, that, uh, that's what I've been talking about. That's the that's option of you. Make it a plugin or Java applet, but again, when you do that, the lifespan of your peer-to-peer -peer service will be within the lifespan of the browser. If you close the browser, it's gone. All right. So, uh, one is navigating away from the page, and other things keeping the browser open. So, if you make it a browser plugin. So you keep the browser well, open. Yeah, as long so the browser. That depends on user habit. I, I like to close the browser. <laughs> but this is a very good point. To, we're thinking about uh, if, the project, if the project continues, we, the next thing we want to do is to package this thing into, a, uh, into a, either a plugin or a Java applet. That sounds a viable option to us. We, of course, we hope the user too. So, but Please don't close your browser. So this is a software yes. and people are in there. And then even users navigate the way or close the browser. As long as the computer runs, as long as the computer runs, we are using our bandwidth. So, so if it's if it's bang, your client are not inclusive in the sense, will it adjust uh, local resource co consumption depending on 
what other processes are running and their CPU utilization and needs and so on? Well, uh, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, if I get this right, the resource consumption on the local side, it pretty much depends on what files you have cached. So basically, you're, you're browsing videos in, uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer way, right? So when you browse through the videos, uh, when you watch these videos, they are cached in your local hard drive. So it depends <coughs> on how popular your, your files are, but if your files are ready. If, if, if I am an avid watcher of popular clips, mm -hmm. then my machine will get hogged. Well, of course, possibly. But uh, we, uh, fortunately, we, of course, we, uh, the question is, if you are caching some very hot files, well, how about what if some lots of peers come to uh, ask that files from you? Uh, <coughs> actually, with this regard, we just, uh, we just actually borrowed the nice functionalities from BitTorrent. BitTorrent has uploading rate constraint and also CPU. It, it gives away to the CPU consumption. Okay, the latest version of BitTorrent allows it to first constrain your uploading bandwidth, you know, how much bandwidth you want to put into this application. Second, give way to other applications. It actually watches the CPU consumption of your machine. If the CPU consumption suddenly goes up, that means, you're, that means that you have some other application goes on. In that case, the BitTorrent chooses to back off, chooses to back off because BitTorrent is always a background application. So all the, they have all these nice features there, so why don't we just use it? And that's what we did. We just go ahead and use it. Good point, yes. You want to make sure that you do not hawk your local computers, even though you want to help others. Okay, I need to. So, uh, next I'm gonna talk about how we, how we implement this software. So we, uh, uh, we basically, as you can see, we, we adapt our solutions from BitTorrent. Okay. Why we use BitTorrent? Well, it is because it's popular. It is actually, I think, it's a de facto protocol for the P2P file downloading today. You know, it was uh, first authored by Bram Cohen, and uh, it was, uh, I think, it, the first version finished up in the summer of 2002. Um, it was released as open source. This is very important. And it has, because it was open source, it has such a huge impact for the P2P applications coming after that. Uh, because the lots of because it's very stable, it, per, it performs very well. Lots of applications actually sort of uh, are, are adapted from the original bit source code of, uh, of BitTorrent. There are lots of uh, BitTorrent compliance softwares, uh, which are you know they're implemented in different languages, but they all uh, they all uh, 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 follow the uh, BitTorrent protocol, uh, which is also open protocol. Uh, which is pretty neat uh, if you ever use BitTorrent. Uh, if you ever use BitTorrent to download a file, and when you check out other peers, you can see they're all running all kinds of BitTorrent softwares. As far as I know, there are more than 50 popular BitTorrent softwares uh, in, in, in the sense that they, are, they, are all fo they all follow the BitTorrent protocols. So, so... I think I'm using BitTorrent, and you are using BitCommand. We can download the same file. Of course, of course, definitely, yes, yes, definitely. You can, you can, we, we just, we just use different softwares, but still download the same thing. Actually, the same file. Yeah, over the, any kind of oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Compliance. Actually, our software also can coexist with other softwares, you know. Yeah. That's other, our, sort of the, our, you know, the reason why we choose this uh, option. We're thinking, you know, what if the user say, yeah, you, your idea seems fine, but I just don't want to download your software. I want to use mine. Fine, you know, download the torrent, download the video get the torrent file and download the videos. It should work, right? As long as your software follows the BitTorrent protocol. So that's, to sum it up, that's the benefits. First, you get stable open source code. Uh, we can use open source code in academia. So it saves a lot, so much development time. And also it's interoperable with other uh, P2P softwares as long as they follow the BitTorrent protocol. I'll uh, just to give you a very brief overview of how the, how the thing works. And uh, in BitTorrent, a file is divided up into very many small pieces. And uh, you have a torrent file, which is basically a metadata file, which is to sort of so summarize the property of the file. And also you need a tracker to coordinate all the peers. And uh, all these peers, if they're interested with the same file, they are called a swarm. So all these are sort of a BitTorrent languages. I'll try to sort of... Uh, use that as least as, as I could in, the, in, in, in this talk. And there are a few key functions in the BitTorrent. 
and uh, which we are actually sort of adapting in our, in our implementation. First one is tracker. So if you're talking about a very popular file, there could be thousands of peers accessing the downloading the files at the same time. But if you ask the tracker to return the list of peers you know, uh, that you can download data from, the tracker only gives you a subset of those peers. The tracker does not give you the complete list. So there's a selection problem there. You know, how do you select the subset of peers from all these existing uh, active peers? Second one is called choker. All right. So say you have got this peer list from the tracker, and which are the peers you choose to upload data to? Uh, I'm going to come back to that a little more on the, how, the, how the choker works. And the final one is the piece picker. So say you have, the, the, say you have selected you know, which peers you want to upload data to, and how do you choose the pieces? You know, which, which piece you want to, you want to download first? So all, these, uh, so all these are key functions by, uh, uh, in the original design of BitTorrent. So they have uh, different mechanisms that are also they exist for a reason. And also I'm going to talk about why we changed that. So let me first talk about the tracker. So BitTorrent uses the random selection method. So basically they, they return a constant number, usually 50 peers. And their selection is totally random. They just uh, pick uh, 50 random peers from, uh, from the active peers. And uh, <coughs> if the client finds out that uh, the active peers starts to drop below a certain threshold, for instance, you know, you got 50 active peers from the from a tracker, and, and as time goes, lots of peers die or leave. And if the active peers go down to, let's say, 20, you ask the tracker to give you a new list again. So that's how the uh, tracker works. Obviously, it does this without thinking about, you know, oh, you know, does this does this period is this period in the same ISP as mine? You know, that kind of question. It doesn't it doesn't consider that. Then it, when it comes to choker. So what it does, what happened here is that first, uh, you, after you get the peer list, you exchange the uh, half messages with all other peers uh, in your list. So basically, you're asking, you know, what pieces do you have? So you're exchanging that kind of information. And then it actually chokes most of the peers. By choking means that I do not want to share data with you. I just, uh, I do not want to upload data things. I, want, I, I do not want to upload things to you. And it only sends unchoked messages to a very few number of peers. A default value is four. So you're unchoking four peers, meaning that I want to share my data with you. So what's your selection criteria? The selection criteria of BitTorrent is that you want to choose to upload to unchoke the peers who has, who has given you most of the data. So you want to unchoke the peers with the highest uploading risk to you. So it's, this is called reciprocation, you know, tit for tat. If you give me data, I will share my data with you. And finally, it has a mechanism called optimistic unchoking, meaning that I will just choose to unchoke, do a favor to a random peer. I will just choose to unchoke you for no reason. Okay, I just choose you randomly by saying that, okay, you're a lucky guy, and uh, I, I, I want to share my data with you. So it turns out this is very important to bootstrap a new peer, because if you think you're a new peer who just joined the system, you have nothing to share. Without optim optimistic and choking, you can never bootstrap yourself. You can never get the data from other peers. So the, opti uh, so the unchoking, the normal unchoking, executed uh, every 10 seconds, and optimistic and choking got executed every 30 seconds. Um, uh, the 35 uh, peers which use exchange of each field values, uh, are they randomly selected? Yes, randomly selected. Why, uh, what's the reason? Uh, why is the reason why do we, why do we, I don't know, I, I honestly know, but they chose 35. Right? I see. But again, you can, you can change all these values, but the default value is this. 50 peers, 50 peers in the peer list, to choose the exchange field, bit field messages with 35 peers, and unchoke four, optimi opti optimistic unchoke one. Okay. The last thing I want to mention to the original BitTorrent design is called something called the piece picker. So what they do is that okay, so you have these unchoked peers, 
Uh, so the, those peers you can download data from. So when the peers send you entropy messages, that means you could uh, choose to download data from this peer. So which, uh, you know, which piece do you want to download? And uh, the BitTorrent's choice is that they want to download the piece with the minimum interest value. So interest value is defined as the number of peers possessing this piece. So how do you know that? Well, you know that by, get, by collecting the half messages you collected from other peers. So you collect the half message from other peers, and you can basically do a calculation, you know, how many other peers have this particular piece. And you want to uh, choose the piece which is the rarest, okay? And if there's a tie, you just, broke the, you just break the tie arbitrarily, okay? So the reason why they want to, you, the, for this rarest first policy, is that they want to help promote, promote the piece diversity of all peers. So they, if the certain piece is very rare among the whole swarm, you want to sort of promote the availability of these pieces so that it will go spread out as soon as possible. You will only choose from the peers who unchoke you. Uh, you still, I, as far as I know, you still count that. Even though some peers, so for instance, the, the interest value is three. The three means that three other peers contain this piece, even though probably some of them are choose to choking you, but you still count that in. What still count that in? You still count that in because what you want to know is the knowledge of how many peer, how many peers in the entire swarm have this piece. That's the goal. Right? A good question. Okay. So, so BitTorrent works very nicely, and so, uh, but still, uh, you know, when we adapt, uh, when we try to adapt to our system, we still sort of spot the following limitations. And the uh, first one is the, uh, it doesn't have a concern over locality, okay? Uh, it produces lots of inter-ISP traffic. In, the ISPs are not happy to see that. And also, I think it's the main reason why they throttle the BitTorrent traffic. And also, because it doesn't have a notion of a locality, it sometimes it just, it, this is very inefficient. inefficient. You just uh, download the piece from very far away peers when actually that piece got possessed by a nearby peer. And how do you, you, know, how do you remedy that? And another limitation is that it does not support the video streaming application because of the rarest first policy. It does not have no idea about you know, which, uh, where that piece is. Uh, regards your video playback, you know. So, uh, so in the worst case, you can actually have, you have to wait until uh, the very first piece got downloaded so that you can, your playback will continue. So we try to accommodate all these issues in our, uh, in our own implementation. So the first thing we did is that we try to embed the locality awareness into a few key operations in BitTorrent particularly the tracker, how the tracker works, and how the choker works, and how the piece picker works. We try to implant locality awareness into all, into all these functions, into all these components of BitTorrent. That's the first thing we do. Uh, second thing we do is that we introduce a window-based approach. It's basically, the idea is very simple. You add, you add a window to the piece selection and saying that uh, you can, choose, you can uh, follow whatever piece picking policy, but that policy has to be restrained in this certain window in your file, which is basically a continuous subset of pieces in your video file, which marches along with your video playback. And I want to say that we are not the first one to sort of do these tweaks. Uh, for the window-based approaches, a few others have been trying this idea, and uh, Beatles and Bass. This is by the folks in UC Riverside. This is by the folks in UC Davis. This is by the folks in uh, Purdue. And also BitTorrent, as a company, has a solution too uh, to support video streaming called BitTorrent DNA. Uh, so the, the window-based approach is not new. So uh, a few other folks have tried that already. Uh, for the locality issues, I also spotted some works uh, that try to implement, implement locality awareness into BitTorrent. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's one uh, ICDCS paper by uh, by uh, folks in Stanford and uh, Cisco, which talked about how do you do the tracker locality. But we are the ones who sort of try all of these uh, and then combine them in a video streaming setting and test the results of how this idea works. So the first thing we try is called tracker locality. And the idea is that uh, 
we want to choose the peer in the sense that uh, based on the criteria that these peers are the closest uh, to the requesting peer. Now the question is how would you define closest? How would you define a distance? There are many ways to define a distance. And the one example we try is that we define it as AS hop. So AS hop, uh, AS meaning autonomous system, and the AS hop basically means that how many ISPs uh, does, uh, does the P's have to travel if you choose to download from a certain peer? Uh, we, can dis we will discuss more on that. So this is one distance value we try. And there's also we note that the distance value can be actually attached to an add-on field in the peer list. So you can easily add this information uh, to the peer list returned by the tracker. Another question is that who's going to maintain all this information? You know, oh, okay, we have two pair of peers, so uh, how close are they in terms of AS distances? We think that the tracker might be the best guy to do this job if, because tracker is the, the one who has a global view, and that's how we do it in our, in our implementation, which also we're going to spend more time talking about, you know, how do we, how we obtain this knowledge. So that's the first tweak we have, you know, introducing locality to the neighbor selection in the tracker. Second thing we try is that we implant locality into the choker. What we do is that we change this. We change the unchoking process. In the original unchoking, uh, in, in the original BitTorrent system, they unchoke the ones who give you the most data. Here, in our system, we choose to unchoke the ones who are closest to you. Okay, we choose, we send unchoke messages to the peers which are closest to yourself where the distance is also follow the definition here. AS hop, AS, AS hop, AS distance in our experiment, okay. So then I think this is a pretty big change because you're not doing tit for tat anymore. Instead you're doing, you're trying to benefit the one who are closest to you. And of course we still keep the opti optimi optimistic and choking unchanged because again, uh, we, you, uh, you, you still want to bootstrap the new peers. No matter how much you want how much locality awareness do you want to plant into your system? You still want to, want it to be able to help out the new peers, okay? So this will be changed. That no tip for tag, uh, this optimistic on token looks unnecessary because even if you have nothing to share with others, you are still located close to somebody else. Right, right. Uh, let, me, let me say this. Uh, uh, well, we can, we, can, we can discuss more on that. So let me just get one thing. Let me just get one thing straight. So it's this idea. My my sound sort of doesn't working uh, in in the first place. But let me say that the choking and unchoking process only happened sort of uh, to the peers who had a different piece collection from you. Okay, who had a different interest values from you. So it can happen that there ex exists another peer who has exactly the same piece collection from you. In that case, BitTorrent automatically filter these peers out. So you're, all, you're only consistent. You're, so you're, whether you're choking or uh, whether you're doing choking or unchoking, your decisions are only applied to those peers who have different piece collection from you. So this is also implement, given by the BitTorrent. So the idea will actually work. And also, if you do that, sort of it, it will function like this. Say you are the seed. At the beginning, you are the only seed and you choose to only give your pieces to the one closest to you, say to the one who had to peer in your closest radius, okay? And these, they, those peers as a downloading download peer will also only choose the exchange data with their closest peers, okay? So in that sense, your data got generally propagated like uh, in, a, in, a, in a gradually fashion. Of course, each piece travel very, in, a, in a very short distance, but the seed population uh, sort of uh, 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 grows by in, in a step-by-step yeah, okay. -step fashion uh, in a growing radius. That's how the choker, that's the effect of a choker locality. <coughs> Last thing we try is called piece piece score locality where you base your piece picking uh, decision not on the uh, interest value, but on the distance value. So we, do, we uh, define distance value as the average distance of all peers possessing this piece. So you're actually choose the piece, uh, you're, you're sort of, you're choosing the piece which are on average closest to you. Okay. So that's the last thing we try. 
and of course, uh, we try another tweak to the BitTorrent, which is we uh, uh, add a playback window to the peace speaker, uh, to the peace speaking to the peace selection process. Okay, so whatever you can you can apply whatever peace speaking class uh, policy here, but again your your choice is constrained within this playback window, which goes along uh, which goes along with your uh, with your playback. So idea seems straight, uh, straight, uh, straight, uh, straightforward enough to you guys, but let me just say one thing, you know, which is, you know, how do you move along? Because the window has to be moved along, all right, all the time, uh, going with the playback. How do you know, you know, when to when to move this window? Well, if the leftmost piece of that window got downloaded, fine. We just you just push the window one, you know, one step, one piece further. That's fine. But well, the question is, what if you know this leftmost piece does not get downloaded for a while, and you miss the playback? Okay, it, it, can, it can happen. So our choice is that if such a thing happens, if the leftmost piece data doesn't get downloaded, doesn't get downloaded when it should be downloaded, we choose to download it from the uh, using the server thread. So the question is, I think the question is, you know. Uh, now we have, it's a hybrid approach, right? You download from both the peer-to-peer -peer thread and the client server thread. And the question, is, the question you have to answer is that when do you use the client server thread? And this is the time that you use the client server thread. If you are, the moving of your window falls, back the, falls behind the playback, this is the time to trigger the client server thread. <clears throat> Another question is, how do you know how fast your playback window should move? You know? In other words, how do you know the streaming rate of your videos? That's another question. So uh, there's no, I, I, probably there's no easy answer here. What we choose to do is that uh, we, in our current implementation, uh, we sort of implant that uh, streaming rate information as one more metadata uh, in, our, uh, in our request stream, uh, request a stream. And a streaming rate is a simple calculation of the size of the video over the time length of the video. Okay, there's a very simple, uh, very simple calculation of the streaming rate of the video. So we have to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind that there is an issue of you know how, when should you, when you the so first one is how fast does the play window has to go, and also when you sh when should you use the uh, client server process to basically push that window forward if you have to. So these are the implementation issues, and uh, the next thing I want to present is the results. Um, we deploy our system over Planet Lab. Uh, Planet Lab is uh, sort of a, a uh, um, uh, is a popular testbed in the networking and distributed system field, uh, where the the rule of Planet Lab is that uh, if you want to join the Planet Lab, you have you have to give out some machines uh, to the Planet Planet Lab first. So we, uh, in Vanderbilt, we have two PCs dedicated to Plan Lab nodes. Uh, to, to, the, to this testbed, in return, we, we earn the access of all the machines in, the, in this testbed, if they're up and running. Um, <coughs> and also, we, uh, 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 we use two, two more PC machines in our lab, uh, which one as, one as the server and the other one as the tracker. And, uh, and uh, excuse me. And so throughout our experiment, we uh, allow the peers to, to see for 10 minutes. So basically, mind you that this is the online duration time I've been talking about in the beginning of this talk. So you want the peer to, be, to want to stay after, okay, after the peer have downloaded the whole thing and play back the file, you want them to stay online a little bit more. That's very important to make the peer-to-peer uh, -peer serve, uh, uh, -peer serve the on-demand applications better. Now, uh, one nice thing about Planet Lab is that you have the full control of the Planet Lab node, all the Planet Lab nodes, when you run the experiment. So what we do is that we want each node to fill out the piece level traces you know, along, the, along the downloading phase. So basically, there are three fields here. The sequence, every time a piece got downloaded, you remember the sequence number of the piece, you remember the time stamp that you received this piece, you remember the source, you know, from where do you get this piece from? From which other peer you get this piece from? So if you have all these uh, results, uh, sorry, uh, trace, 
traces collected from all the peers. You can actually, you can practically generate any kind of results you want, uh, which we generate a lot. And the test file we use is a flash file you download from YouTube. And uh, so this is the time it got requested uh, as I see it. So the way we get this information from is that uh, YouTube, uh, in the web page of YouTube, there was, a, uh, there was a tag which basically tells you how many times these videos has been viewed. So you just uh, uh, access the same page throughout different points of time and subtract sub that. You can get the number of requests you have, uh, this video has collected uh, in a certain period of time. But you do not, that's the best you can get, you know. And so average, uh, on average, this particular video got, uh, uh, got requested for 1.5 times per second, which is uh, pretty popular, I think, in this period of time. Um, the original file, the, the video file was actually, it's pretty small, it only asked about 10, three minutes, a little bit more than three minutes, and this is the size of the file. So when we first do experiment, we think, oh, this, this file is too small, how about we replace it with a bigger one? We replace it with a bigger video file, still following the same request pattern. So this is the one we use. So it's actually, it's a, it's a TV episode, it lasts about uh, 28 minutes, uh, more than 28 minutes, and this is the size of that video file. So this is the one we actually use for the experiment. <laughs> and before I talk about results, I want to say one more thing about uh, how you know, we obtain the ISP map uh, using Planet Lab. As I said, uh, you have the full control over all the Planet Lab nodes. So that means you can actually make all these nodes to, do, to actually run any software you want. And so what we do is that <coughs> we run a trace route between each pair of Planet Lab nodes. Okay, that trace route return, returns the IP addresses of all the hops along the end-to-end -end path between two peers. The second thing we do is that we look up the IPs, IP addresses of, sorry, look, look uh, sorry, we, we look up, we look it up, look up these IP addresses and get their AS number, okay? And we can do that. There are lots of uh, actually public AS lookup services on the web. So this is what we do. And so when you do that, you actually obtain a so-called AS path. So for instance, this is a ping message from one Planet Lab node in Berkeley to another Planet Lab node at Stanford. Okay. This is the IP path. Uh, the entire end-to-end -end path goes through eight hosts. Many of them are routers. But in terms of the AS path, that actually goes up from, it goes, it, it, the, the path starts from Berkeley, which is AS25, uh, goes up to uh, another AS, which is California State University Network, which turns out to be the provider, uh, provider ISP of this ISP and this ISP. Okay, so it goes up to its provider and then go down to the, another customer of this same provider, which is Stanford University. So by following these two steps, we actually obtain the AS path of any pair of Planet Lab nodes, okay? any appearance of Planet Lab node. And the third thing we try is that we, want, we look up this AS pair and figure out what they are, you know, because they are, there are basically four kinds of relationship for AS pair. They could be provider customer, a customer provider, a peer-to-peer -peer link, peering ISP. So basically two ISPs can actually choose to peer with each other and sort of saying, okay, you know, we, we do not charge, it, we do not charge traffic, we, we do not charge each other's traffic. Last one is sibling ISPs, which are the ISPs actually own, uh, two ISPs actually owned by the same institution. So <clears throat> what we do is that we look up these AS pairs in a public database called CIDA. And from there, we found some, actually from the database, we, we, are, we are able to identify 70% of AS pairs, okay, in, our, in, a, in a map that we just obtained by running trace routes. And then, for the remaining AS pairs, we try to sort of figure them out by applying the value-free property. Uh, this is a property that the, so mostly agreed upon by the internet researchers is that this is the way that the, the routing should be working if the PGP routers got configured correctly. Okay. So basically the value-free property states that if your AS path starts to go down, meaning that if you realize, if you find out that uh, your packet starts to travel from a from a provider to the customer, it should never go back. Okay, if if it starts to go down, it should always go down. Okay, until the end of it, it should not go to go. It should not go level up uh, to another peer or should go up to another to another uh, to another uh, provider. It doesn't work this way. So that's how the value 
That's what I mean by value-free property. So if we constrain this sort of, if we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, enforce this constraint over the unidentified AS, AS pairs, we find that the, the remaining 20% got figured out. We just figure out what they are. But finally, there are 10% AS pairs. We just don't know what they are. You know, we, and then we just uh, ignore them. So this is how we get the ASP map. Uh, they're, they're proved to be very useful when we discuss, when we uh, 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 um, study the uh, uh, impact on the ISPs. So what kind of results do we want to get? You know, you see there are, uh, there are also a few players in this field. You know, and uh, as a as a when we want to introduce a new technology into it, we want to make sure that not to not to displease any one of them. Uh, we try not to displease any one of them. So, server, you know, the one who are the video services, these are the ones you want to please because you are saving money for them. And users, you don't want to, so you, they're happy with what they're having now, so you don't want to downgrade their, their user experience. So these, these are the two people that you want to please this person, you want to please the services guys, and you also you want to please the users. And, ISPs are probably the ones that are not happy about this change because peer-to-peer -peer traffic introduces inter-ISP traffic. So the, the best we can do is that we minimize this impact, you know. And also the, the, the last thing what we want to find out is that uh, how our system uh, will make the peer contribute. Uh, it, uh, the, we w mainly want to study the fairness issues in this item here. And uh, <coughs> the other things we want to find out is that you know the BitTorrent has its own design goals and its tracker in its how in terms of how its tracker and piece picker and uh, choker works. They have their own original design goals. Now we introduce another design goal. We want to be we want it to be to be to be able to local to to we want it to have locality awareness. We want it to be able to accommodate the streaming application. So we want to know how these new design goals interplay with the old ones. Okay. So, server load reduction. We choose, we run the original BitTorrent. Mind you that uh, uh, the original Bit, uh, sorry, okay, excuse me. Starting from here, the BitTorrent. We run the, the original BitTorrent protocol. So, you can imagine that as the window-based approach where the size of the window equals to the size of the file, okay? so. Even in the BitTorrent cases, you still want to, sometimes you want to trigger the server because sometimes, because BitTorrent download in a in total, total un, in a random fashion. So and there are many cases that you want the server to kick in, you know, to, to help the smooth, smooth out the playback. Yeah. This is what happened for the window-based approach. So what we do is that we enforce a window whose size is 20 pieces. In, in case you want to know, you know, how much time it translates to, in the video file that we tried, each piece on average, translates to 4.5, 4.25 seconds of playback. So 20 minutes, 20 seconds is about uh, more than one minute of playing back. Okay. Then we find out that the best policy turns out to be the rarest first policy. So you enforce the rarest, rarest first policy within the window. Okay. These are the three locality policies we try. The worst one is the tracker locality. Okay. And the best one is the piece picker locality. So these two, these three. Lo so when you enforce a locality you lose some of the efficiency because you, you sort of constrain the selection of the peers or the way you choose the, piece, choose the download and choose what pieces to download from the peer. But I think overall, I, my, I mean, there are still pretty uh, decent numbers except this one, you know. Yes? What is the server load? What does this percentage number mean? Is so that the I'm, I'm sorry, server load reduction. It means that this, many, this much percent of the traffic are carried out by the P2P. I'm sorry, yes. This, the title should be server load reduction. Okay. How come BitTorrent hmm? reduction? How come this? How come this one is better than this one? Right? Well, because BitTorrent, or you can imagine this one, this this solution, this idea. So this this uh, uh, configuration as one with window size is too big. When the window size is too big, oftentimes you want to trigger the client server to to keep the wind keep 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 the playback goes. Hmm? The same rate as the streaming is, right? That's right. Uh, we want to client the downloads. Keep in mind that it, throughout all these experiments, we have a client server thread going, you know, to keep the playback smooth, you know. Uh, in this basic experiment, uh, the number of 
The number of peers is 200. OK, one more thing I want to say. PyLab is a very unstable system. Lots of the peers, lots of the nodes are remain either dead or not responding at the same time. So after repeated experiments, we just filter out 20, 200 nodes of them, which are mostly responding. Even that, <coughs> we find out that throughout our, our experiments, there are always some of the peers that are not responding for some unknown reasons. So let me just uh, skip, a few skip a few notes here, uh, slide, uh, pictures here. So throughout all experiments, we find out that less than 160 nodes, these are the nodes that always respond to you. These are nodes who always download. So these results you see here are filtered out from those less, you know, less than 160 nodes. This is our guiding. OK, let me speed up here. This is the server load per peer, and what we show here is that going from here to here, these are the peers who are entirely self-support, self-sufficient. They do not need help from the server at all. Okay, and these are the few pod, another pod, uh, different policies we tried, and uh, we, what we can see from the results, you know, uh, by comparing it to the previous slide I show you, is that uh, the more peers that are able to self-support themselves the greater the server load reduction is going to be. So these are consistent. And uh, this is a metric that we did, uh, defined by ourselves. It's called interruption. So interruption, basically, interruption uh, is the, the kind of a stage where if the piece, certain piece is missing the playback, so missing, you know, the playback cannot continue. And uh, you will exit from this stage when you can start to play back again. So what we do, is that we just play back the traces we collected on every node and see, you know, if they ever in, in, experience interruption, and if so, how much, how long does the interruption uh, last? And this is what we find out. So, <clears throat> actually, when it comes to this, uh, all I can say is that the client-server threat is very important. You know, uh, 80, uh, throughout all the policies, 80% of the peers have no interruptions, and the 10% of them have interruption less than 100 seconds. And for the last, for the yet yeah, the remaining 10% of the peers, they have extremely large interruption times, which we still cannot explain really uh, at this point. And uh, all this poli all this policy got mixed up here, so which means that all I can say here is that client server, I, the idea of a client server thread works. You know, it actually helps smooth out the playback for most of the peers. For those peers, which experience super long interruptions, mm -hmm. can they download from the server directly? They should. So here, if you consider the pure P solution, oh, it's a hybrid solution. Hybrid solution. solution. If it's hybrid pure solution, solution, it's got to be even worse. Okay, so if it's a hybrid solution, then these peers should download from the server directly. And they, they should, should, but we don't know why they're there. They should be able to download from the yeah. server, but somehow. The peer just hands there. Most probably, be, yeah, you got that right. So. Throughout the experiments, we got killed all over the planet. Though, no? so we got complaint emails so more than once. And also, you have only one server. So if the peers link to that server is bad, there's nothing which you can help. I see. Oh, we can skip that. So, <coughs> so next is a series of results related to locality awareness. And uh, before we actually show our results, I just want to say uh, we, we uh, come up with an optimal strategy. So what it does is that, okay, this is, we're thinking, oh, no, you know, how much we need a baseline strategy to show you know, how much, you know, uh, how much, uh, 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 what is the, opt what's the, what's the optimal performance it could possibly be if there's a, a, such an optimal strategy. So the strategy works as this way. It basically is constructed mis a minimum spending tree, okay? So if you're a new peer who would just join the system, you're asking, you know, which is the peer who are closest to me, okay? You find that peer and you're saying, okay, I'm going to get all my data from this peer. It obviously doesn't work. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a minimum, it's a spending tree approach, and it doesn't have a degree constraint. But the, con but the, but the, but, but the functions of this strategy is to show us, you know, how much, uh, how much uh, you know, uh, uh, inner SP traffic you can actually possibly avoid, you know, because this is how the optimal, this is how it works optimally. So basically, uh, <coughs> you, 
if there are multiple peers within the same ISP, you just want all these peers to, to sort of download data from each other. Um, you know, uh, there are only a, what we possibly only a maximum one link is allowed to across uh, two ISPs. You know, so I mean, anyway, so this strategy served as the baseline strategy. Scared. No, I don't. I don't at all. This is not. This this one doesn't work. It's just a theoretically optimal strategy. It doesn't work at all. So the first thing I show you is called AS hop count. You know, so it basically it is the average value. So so think about you're downloading thousands of pieces at per peer. Um, each piece travel a different distance. We just average them out. You know, we want to know how many ISPs it has traveled. It has it has across throughout the downloading. And we sort them out. This is the peer index. We just sort all these curves independently and see how the curve goes. <coughs> One thing I want, a few things I want to point out. So if you look at the minimum AS hop strategy, about half of the peers provide travel zero distance. These are the peers who actually happen to have another peer in the same ISP. Okay, according to the minimum optimum strategy, you will just get all your data from another peer within the same ISP. That's why you get all the zeros here. Um, if you look at the other realistic strategies, you realize that uh, the tracker locality has the best performance, and the BitTorrent and uh, the peace speaker locality has sort of the worst performance. Um, I mean, all I want to point out in this figure is that it looks like that these parts, you know, the tracker locality is only sort of a lower, a little bit lower than the, uh, uh, than the other policies, but keep in mind this is AS hop count. Actually, so you can actually travel quite a few hops within the same ISP. So the saving is actually, if you translate that saving from the AS hop count to the actually IP hop count, the saving is going to be pretty, pretty big. The saving is going to be pretty big. Okay. So if you still recall the server load reduction uh, statistic uh, st uh, results there, tracker locality has the worst server load reduction, but it has the best uh, AS hop count <laughs> results. So if you restrain the collection, if you restrain the selection, sorry, if you restrain the peer selection to be locality aware, you will lose some performance there in terms of the server load reduction. Redundancy is uh, defined by an, I think, by an ICDCS paper. So what it says is that what it uh, it what it represents is the number of times a piece has to enter an ISP until all the ISPs in that same ISP got finished downloading. So this is how the idea works. Suppose you have a few peers in the same ISP. You want to download the file. The, download, the file has to enter the ISP for at least once. In the best case, when that file enters the ISP, it should circulate within the same peers of the ISP and never exit. So in, that, in other words, other peers should not download the same file again because you already have a copy within your ISP. But this is, well, that's the reality. And so that's, that's the ideal case. But sometimes, uh, in reality, you still want some of the peers still want to download the same piece of data from from other peers outside the same ISP again. Okay. So in the worst case, if you have n peers in the ISP, all these n peers, all these peers start to uh, choose to download data from another peer outside the ISP. This is the worst case. Okay. What we uh, further uh, what we further uh, uh, propose here is something called normalized redundancy, which is a redundancy value normalized by the number of peers. So as you can see from the optimal strategy here. So what this strategy actually shows you is how many peers along all, all those ISP, ISP got involved uh, in this whole experiment here, which is less than 80. How many peers does each ISP have? This peer, this, this is the ISP have most of the peer, which has 10 peers. This is the one with most of the peers. This one probably have six. This one probably have four. You know, uh, all those peers, these are the ISPs that has only one peer in the experiment. Okay, that's what it shows you. Yes? Sorry, I, I get confused by that basically. The vertical access is the normalized redundancy? Or normalized redundancy. redundancy. Okay, that means one is, means, uh, number one means? Number one means that you have, in the experiment, there is only one peer in the ISP. If there is only one peer in the ISP, you have to get a data from another, from a peer outside the ISP anyway. So the redundancy is one. So basically, one five means you have two peers in that ISP. One five. Where's one five? 
You mean one over five? This basically, this blue figure, yeah. you have this 0.5 from around 30. 0.5 means there are only two peers in LSP, exactly. So, if in correctly, there's about 40 peers, which uh, there's only one peer in each ISP. Exactly, yeah. exactly. There are yeah, about 40. We have 35 peers, which is yeah, two yeah. peers in each ISP. Yeah, right, okay. right. So, basically, because the optimal strategy, always make sure that the redundancy value is one. So the normalized redundancy value actually tells you how many peers are in ISP that in, in this experiment. I think another way to put it is uh, what you're plotting is intra-ISP, uh, the, the efficiency of intra-ISP piece sharing. I agree, yes. The efficiency of intra-ISP sharing. And uh, let's see, tracker locality still have put, puts out the best performance. Everyone's, exactly, everyone's still quite far away from the optimal point here. But let me show you the next figure, you will see the reason why. This peer contribution, basically it is sorted view of how much data each peer has, has uploaded. And you realize that the blue, the blue line is very short. And the reason is that in optimal strategy, because it's a tree strategy, more than half of the peers do not contribute at all. This is the problem of the tree solutions, because in the tree solution, there are always half of the peer. They are the leaf nodes. They do not share the bandwidth at all. In the BitTorrent-based type solutions, the, the BitTorrent-type solution is the most unstructured solution in the sense that you, know, you can just share data. You know, as long as you have a different pieces, you just throw it out to another peer. Right? Somewhere in the middle, the tree solution is the most structured solution. Somewhere in the middle is a multi-tree solution or the mesh solutions where you can actually, you can be a leaf node in one tree but a non-leaf node in another tree. So that's the reason why. So there has to be some kind of trade-off. You, know, you, you can never achieve to this optimal point you know, because uh, the utilization of the uploading bandwidth will be too small. You know. So these realistic strategies will be actually somewhere in the middle. You know. If you want the peer to contribute more, you have to sacrifice that. So the question will be that what we, what, where, the sweet spot, where the sweet spot is. And again, let me just say uh, very quickly that, uh, <clears throat> again, tracker locality has the worst performance. It has the most uneven contribution. Okay. Um, the, which one? Okay. The BitTorrent and the Choco locality sort of has the best uh, Perform in terms of the, they even out the contributions. They enforce a fairness uh, in terms of peer contributions. They, they, do, they, they, they do the best job uh, throughout, the policies, throughout the policies we try. This figure show, tells you throughout the downloading for each peer, throughout this downloading, how many supplying peers you actually get data from. So it sort of, sort of it shows you the diversity of your downloading. Okay? The more peers you download data from, you know, that means the more selection you have and the more diversity you have. BitTorrent achieves the best the diversity. In BitTorrent, if you follow the BitTorrent policy, it actually allows you to download from most of the peers. Tracker locality has the worst performance. So, so when, you look at, when you look at through all these results, you, you discover that, yes. X row is X axis is the sorted view of peers. So what we happen is that we check out the peer, we check out the number of downloading peers that each uh, number uh, number of each number of supplying peers each peer have throughout this downloading, and we sort them out. Okay, so this means that the, uh, the peers with minimum neighbors is like you know, the maximum is like uh, about eighty. Yeah, exactly. Maximum is about. Uh, Above 80 and the minimum is below 10. Right. Uh, so then we studied the impact on ISPs, but there are uh, the quite a few important pieces of information that we do, not, we do not have. One of them being what's the charge rate for the customer to, of the provider ISP to, to their customers. We do not know that. So instead, we assume that all the ISPs uh, yeah, that's, that, that's the second thing. Uh, we assume that all the ISP charge by the same rate. So if you assume that effectively, 
it becomes the so the work becomes to, to calculate the gain of the, the, the work of you know calculating you know, how much money you make or how much money you pay it effectively becomes you know to count the number of bytes you know you exchange uh, between your either the servicing or the customer ISPs you know so in other words your cost your gain is actually measured by the number of bytes not not actual money because we do not know the charging rate Another assumption we make is that the peering ISPs do not charge each other. So usually peering ISPs have kind of service level agreement with each other. Basically, the agreement goes like this. You know, if you give me traffic more than I give you, I will still not charge you if given that the ratio of asymmetric ratio does not go beyond certain threshold. That's how the service level agreement goes. Again, we do not know this number, so we just make a simplified assumption that if we are peering ISPs, we never charge each other. So this is the assumption. These are the two assumptions, two assumptions we make. And then we basically, because we have the entire ISP map by running the trees throughout all the Platinum Lab nodes, we, can, we, are, we are actually able to pull out you know, how much, whether a given, given an ISP, whether it makes money or loses money, and how much. So the, these are some of the, <coughs> and these are some of the uh, results hole here. Some of the ISPs cost a lot more loses a lot more money, some of the ISPs gains a lot more money. And uh, the, the, the message here is that it's very, very asymmetric game. So the last thing I want to mention before my time is up is that uh, we do a sort of a, a, a separate simulation study over this particular topic. You know, now we have the ISP Mac of all the plant lab nodes. Why don't we just run some, run some simulations over some kind of different strategies and see what kind of impact do they bring to the ISPs. And these are the ideas we try. We try the client-server approach where all the peers get a video file from YouTube. We also have to know what the ISP of the YouTube is, which turns out to be the YouTube itself. We run a random strategy where you just randomly select a parent. We run a minimum AS hop strategy, which I talked about a few slides back. We try another strategy called maximum AS revenue, which basically, you know, they do selection over you know, what your first AS hop is going to be. You always want your first AS hop to the one that can actually bring you money, you know, if possible. And the, if, you, if, you do not, if you're not able to find such a hop, such an AS pair, you find the one uh, with, uh, with you, f you find, uh, excuse me, f you find the one which is peer-to-peer. -peer. So this, this is the one who doesn't make you money, but, but doesn't cost you money anyway. The least favored one will be the one that costs you money. So this is the idea we try. And uh, we also try degree constrained version for all these strategies. And let me just, uh, so the takeaway from this particular simulation study is that this is the typical layout of the, uh, of the finance. If you look at the entire you know, landscape of how, uh, you know, whether, you know, how the ISPs lose money or gain money. So most of them are just, they're just carrying through traffic. They do not make money, they do not, they, do not, they do not profit, they do not lose money either. There are a few losers and there are a few winners. So all the strategies look something like this. And uh, for those, these are the ISPs who lose money uh, across different strategies. And as you can see that obviously the client server strategy is the worst, right? And it turns out, no doubt about it, this one is the YouTube. <laughs> the YouTube ISP costs a lot of money. And, uh, <coughs> And another message I want to deliver is that uh, no matter what kind of strategy, strategies you try, we try different P2P strategies. As long as you try the P2P, try the P2P strategies, the, it's going to save the server ISP, the ISP, whoever ISP who is running the server, is going to save that lot of, uh, uh, lots of cost. So the, the, the reduction goes from 82% to, to 97%. And it turns out that the minimum AS hop strategy is the best one in terms of the uh, cost reduction. And these are the ones in the middle range. They sort of, uh, okay, they sort of, uh, they, they lose a little, some of them lose a little, some of them gain a little. So the, what I want to say here is that overall, this is a zero-sum game, okay, if you just count the number of buys. Uh, if this many number IP, uh, ISPs uh, lose this many, lose so much, so many bytes, which is actually measured by money, these are, will be the same, ISPs will make the same amount of money, you know, in terms of bytes. And now, an interesting thing we find out is that across all the strategies, there are always more ISPs losing money 
than ISPs who and then those who actually gain money, which I think makes sense because in the if you think about the entire structure of ISPs as a tree structure, the ones on top are the ones who actually provide services to the to the below to the underlying customer ISPs, which also is the, how the money goes because money got collected from bottom ISPs up to the provider ISP. And this is the what we have. This is what we find out about all the, all those ISPs who actually make money, uh, who actually profit uh, throughout different strategies. And what we find out is that actually the minimum AS hop strategy actually reduces the highest profit to its minimum. So it's actually sort of more spread out the, the wealth among the other ISPs. You know, and also if you enforce the degree constraints across all these strategies, it will actually bring more ISPs into the competition. So when, it, when more ISPs join the competition, it will further spread out the, 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 the further spread out the profit. So this is the the, the last result I want to show you, and uh, in summary, uh, this is the takeaway I have uh, in this talk, which is the first thing we try in our work is that we just try to design and build a P2P solution to sort of complement the existing uh, video uh, services, uh, internet video services. Our goal is to save the bandwidth cost. And when we design this thing, the, 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 the most important design consideration we have is that we want to uh, bring the minimum interruptions to the existing infrastructure. That's what we have. That sort of motivates our other design considerations, you know, other design uh, choices. And uh, we run this thing over the plan app. And uh, well, it works, you know, and also it Serve, save the server load by a great deal, you know. Uh, meanwhile, it doesn't necessarily sacrifice user experience, if you recall the, uh, uh, um, the interruption uh, figure you saw. So this is the one research item. Uh, the other one is that uh, in our implementation, we actually accommodate the BitTorrent uh, to a few other considerations, like uh, locality awareness and the streaming applications. So these are the... Um, our findings, you know, by looking back all the results uh, we have collected so far. That is, um, there are some conflict about the new design goals, like locality awareness and the streaming applications, to the old design goals of BitTorrent. BitTorrent introduces randomness in a few key operations. If you think about how it randomly collects, selects the peer, and also how you randomly do the optimist, uh, do, uh, how you do the, uh, excuse me, how you randomly select the peers and how it does the various first policy. So the goal of BitTorrent is to speed up, the, speed up the downloading as fast as possible. Okay, that's the original goal of BitTorrent. When we adapt that to meet our goals, we realize that it will actually hurt your performance, although by not, uh, not by a great deal. It will hurt, per, hurt your performance when you look at the server load reduction, the more sort of the, the tracker locality is the most is the strongest policy in terms of enforcing locality, and also the, this, this this tracker locality policy hurts the most. If the tracker locality policy has the worst performance, on the other hand, the best performance is actually still achieved by the very first policy within very first policy, very first policy, which is the policy by designed by the BitTorrent. Yeah, of course, you do that within the window, all right? So, but overall, we think that the cost saving across all the policies uh, is, still, is still kind of decent, except for this one, so. So these are our, uh, um, these are the summary of my talk and uh, questions so far. Any other questions? Uh, like, uh, like, uh, at the very beginning of the talk, you mentioned like TPLI. Uh, you regard them to provide broadcast, and uh, no need to. Uh, that's why you can stop there. Uh, so, so you mentioned that they are mainly for broadcast and live streaming. But however, this kind of software they also provide VOD functions. Uh, how do you do you have like any comparison of like the BitTube and uh, the PP Live VOD? Well, there's some sort of different applications. The question is, how do you compare PP Live and uh, this one? They serve different applications. PP Live serves live streaming applications. Oh, 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 you then have no idea because I got questions like uh, compare, you know, your performance with other commercial applications, but I don't know how it works. Yeah, I, think I wish I know how it works. They have, they have, they have functions for all the existing 
applications like from Shipping Live, you will see they, they all include VOT functions into their latest release. Mm -hmm. And that looks like they are, uh, I, I don't know their uh, mechanism, but maybe it is similar. It should be, I think it should be similar. They could take a, they could they could they could take a tree based approach or a mesh based approach uh, instead of the BitTorrent approach. But uh, and also for the BitTorrent approach, uh, in general, uh, if there is no server only the BitTorrent, it may take a long time to see the first. Uh, you need to take a long delay to see the first frame of the video. Uh, possible. Possible. If you forget about the server. Uh, usually, how long does it take? Oh, that's a good question. If you take if you take out the server, how how would the whole thing perform? I have no idea. It could, it could be very bad. Here's the reason why: server because you are restraining a window, right? You're restraining you're restraining your piece picking yeah, selection in a window, so you actually significantly limit the selection space of your pieces. And uh, it can it can possible that you know uh, without a server, uh, certain pieces got uh, they got spread out so slow in the swarm that it will just further delay the other peers. Even if they have the uploading bandwidth, they just don't have the data to share with. Server, in a sense, bootstrap the whole thing because if certain piece is missing uh, and the play and its time is up, it will try to get it from the server. And with it, uh, this piece. Original pieces, they all mostly they come from the server, and the PCP only actually uh, transmit the later packets instead of the initial packets. Why there will be a difference between uh, the initial and the later? I suppose the server will for give user, you all the pieces. For user if the user wish to click, play, and watch, maybe uh, the PCP may not be too soon to give you enough enough data to watch. So maybe the initial packets, they all come from the server. And while the user wa watch the uh, video for the first like 10 or 20 seconds, it collects data for the later uh, play that time. Yes, possible. We can discuss more offline. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned about how it's important for the peers to stay yeah. some, like some, you know, time after um, and they're watching the video. Is this dependent on the bandwidth that they have, or is it simply a factor of whether they're in the system when other people? Good cool question. This analysis per se uh, relies on a very strong assumption that is each peer must have enough outbound bandwidth to support one another, one other peer. This is our this is how our analysis rests on. If we break this assumption, we have to reanalyze. Thanks, <coughs> thanks, speaker. Thank you.